We've got three simple products at the moment, and we saw that we can add uh, them into these sub-menu items. Well, we then have the ability to do more complex types of products, and it does need a little bit of setup and focus on how this works. But our big idea will be to make variable products. So example. Um, cupcakes sold in one dozen, two dozen, and half dozen varieties, or anything related to that. I need to sell a t-shirt that's red or blue or yellow, and then also small, medium, and large, and maybe charge different amounts for different, uh, different, um, different types. So these work with attributes. The big idea is create an attribute, add values, and then link them to a product. And then optional, add different prices, etc. So there's a few steps that we need to do before we get it into the product. We, we need to set up our attributes and our values. So the attribute is going to be, for example, on a t-shirt, it would be something called size. And then the value would be small, medium, large. There's like, there, there's the, the big, keyword about how are we having different versions of this thing it's going to be a size there could be color the attribute is color and then the value will be red pink blue see the difference there so we have to create an attribute add values to it these three are related to that so then that particular product will have a little menu that says pick your size and size small medium large or have your you have your your drop down menu of for this item choose a color and you have those and yes you can combine them i could sell a t-shirt that has small medium and large and red pink and blue you can get very complex for our particular uh, example of of um, muffins we're going to have one dozen, two dozen, one half dozen as the values. And what would you say as an opinion? What would be the attribute? What would be the name of the little box that you click on to pick one, two, or half dozen? What might you think? Quantity. Quantity, something more like that, because. Um, this has a size of small, medium, large, and a color, red, pink, or blue. So quantity sounds sounds like one we could use, sure. Um, another one that I like is batch. I want to buy a batch of them, one dozen, two dozen, half dozen. So any word is fine, but just think about it in terms of what is the word, what or what is the common word that someone would think about you uh, clicking when, when they're buying your product. So quantity batch, etc. to actually set this up. If we go back into our dashboard, we have to do step one of adding the actual attributes. Those are under products, attributes. So let's hover over products and then select attributes. Attributes let you define extra product data, such as size or color. You can use these attributes in the shop sidebar using layered nav. OK, that's another thing to come back to about. This also helps you when people are filtering through your store. When you have these various attributes and you add this to the sidebar, which we'll come back to, uh, that'll allow people to filter and say, only show me t-shirts that are pink and, and uh, extra large. So it would then give you all of those results name. We'll say batch. And then
then add attribute. So when you're about to buy the muffins, it'll also have you select what's your batch size, one dozen, two dozen, half dozen. So think about maybe if we have the cakes and I have the one layer, two layer, three layer. So the batches, I mean the, the name of the attribute would be layers and then the terms or the values would then be defined there. So let's click on configure terms. This is a little inconsistent. It should call it configure values because it uses the word values on another screen. Configure terms. So some of this is is a, could be a little bit easier to 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 see. We're currently in not really the product batch. We're in the attribute batch. So okay, it says product, but this is the attribute. We're editing the attribute batch. Further down here, add a new batch. Mm, that's not what, really what I'm doing. I'm adding a new value or a new term to this batch. So again, I'm not sure why this is not quite consistent. But we're, we're inside of the batch uh, organizing unit. Here is when then I type one dozen. I won't worry about description just yet, so just add that. So a batch can have a one dozen option. A batch can have two dozen option. And one half dozen option. So when we create a product in a moment, muffins. We will attach this attribute. We will have different prices. Obviously, the one dozen costs some amount, and the two dozen costs another amount. But before I add it to a product, I have to set it up. This is one of the things that, that you do want to set up beforehand. It's not, what I mean is it's, you cannot create this very easily at the same time that you're creating the product. You can create the product and then add the variations. But I would recommend create the variations, then add it to a product. Okay, so if I, if I go back to the, the main attributes, if I go back to attributes just to see it, I have here now that a batch will consist of one, one half, and two dozen. To do one more, let's say size, small, medium, large. So based on what we've already done, we can do the same thing. From, from this top level, add new attribute. Go back to attributes. We can add size. It'll give us a new attribute. We will say configure terms. Then when we're inside size, it'll say add new size. Then we will add small, and then another one, medium, and then another one, and then large. So size is the name of the attribute. There are no terms associated with this attribute. So I will configure terms to add small, medium, and large. So I'll click configure. It changes to say product size, which again I think is not named quite right. It should be attribute size. Further down here it says add a new size. Okay, small. Medium. large.
I can ar arrange them into the order that I want on, on another screen. Because here I'm seeing large, medium, small, I want small, medium, large. I can arrange that on another screen. But basically now, if I confirm back on the attributes screen, I have these two possibilities. Something that I can be selling could have variations of batch. Something that I could sell could have a variation of size. Or something that I sell could have both. I'm going to buy a batch of one dozen, but of small items. So in my notes, I had, you create an attribute, which we did. We added these values. I guess I'll also put here values or terms. Link them to a product. We, we have some existing products, which we can add them to. Or we'll create a new product, muffins, like I've been talking about, or cupcakes. I'm getting all my baked goods confused. We'll say cupcakes. So we're, we're going to create a new cupcake item, and that'll have the, the, um, the batch. Product add new. We'll call this cupcakes. Category cupcakes. So maybe for some description, we'll say um, our batches of cupcakes are very tasty. You just have to pick if you want 12, 24, or 6. One dozen, two dozen, or half a dozen. In order for that to work, this is no longer a simple product. From the drop down menu here below of product data, now we have to set it, set it as a variable product. Once you select variable product, these items change a little bit over here. Simple product, variable product. Well, I, don't, I no longer have like one set. Um, I no longer have one set uh, price. Well, that makes sense because I'm selling things in different prices. But now I have attributes and variations attributes and variations. So make sure you set this to variable and then we'll go to attributes. We've got a drop down list now. We've created batch and size attributes. I want my cupcakes to be sold in batches. <coughs> so I'll save that attribute. Actually, sorry. Uh, you select it here, then you click Add, then Save. I want Batch to be one of the selectable items, so I clicked it. I clicked Add. 
It will be visible on the product page, of course. I want them to select batch. These will be used for variations. So we'll click that. And in this particular variation or attribute, we have one dozen, one half, and two dozen. Well, this particular item, I want it to be sold with those three variations, so I would select select all. I want those three to be used for this product. If I wanted one particular one, I only want to sell them as one dozen and two dozen, I could. But probably you created some attribute with some values because you want to use all the values related to that attribute. So I selected batch, I added it, I want it visible, I want it for variations, I want all the, all the values that I created, now we save it. This particular product has batch attached. If I also wanted size, we won't do size just yet. But if I wanted size, I do the same process. So I'm going to be able to sell cupcakes in batches of one, two, or half dozen. To then set the prices and such, now I go to variations, and that has stuff for us to edit right here. Create variations from all attributes, one, two, or half dozen. Go. Just click OK if you get a pop-up. That pop-up says, if you've got a lot of variations, it may take a while because we have to do multiplication of all your particular items. But that's fine. So click OK. And then now I have here the I have this that can open up. This is a, the example again. OK, is it done? Well, you don't see it until you put your mouse over it. You can click to open it. And now here I can put a, a certain picture for this thing with a certain SKU. It is enabled. What's its price? Is it in stock? I can do all of the details of the one dozen batch, the half, and the, and the other. And then here's where I can drag them to rearrange them. One dozen, two dozen, half dozen, half a dozen, one dozen, two dozen. I want them in that order. You can grab that little those little three lines and then I can say okay my half dozen six I'm gonna say that they're gonna sell for 650 you know a little bit more than a dollar each you buy more you save more if they buy the one dozen 12 of them let's say we'll sell them for eleven dollars you know, enticing them you buy the 24 batch if they really need the 24 okay 2450 you still save and I'm not good at this math sometimes so I don't know if these are actual savings I'm just putting some values but here we have now cupcakes that can be sold with these variations with these individualized prices and this particular one's out of stock or in stock this particular one I only can sell managed stock I can only sell I only have six of them in the back room that I can sell but these one dozens, I have 60 of them. So you can customize all of these uh, by a lot. All of this adds up so that when I publish it, and then I visit my store, I can go to my shop and go look at that product. I never added a picture, that's fine. And so I say we're selling cupcakes between these prices, so all of your range of uh, prices based on your variations are listed. You have to select an option. Now I have batch, choose an option. That'll be 11. That'll be 2450.
So this type of particular product is a variable product. It has variations with a variety of prices, perhaps individual photos and descriptions. It can get pretty complex. I've dealt with a client, it, it was a food client, and when we set this up for them, it was pretty complex because they wanted to sell um, a, a combo with this particular item and this one and this one. You know, there were three. Well, you have to multiply three times three times three, but then on for this item and that item, so there was that's why there was that little warning when, when it popped up a little while ago about are you are you sure you want to add them all? Well I, I didn't have a very complex variation set, so it wasn't so bad. But when you deal with it's got size and color and quantity, well all of those are multiplied together to make, you know, twenty products related to twenty entries related to one product. I don't see uh, cupcakes in my shop menu. That's normal. It doesn't add itself there automatically. We have to go back and edit the menu and add that new category. I made a category after the fact, after I made my menu, so it doesn't add itself automatically. So help me out, walk me through it. How might I go edit my menu to add a new category? If I'm on this if I'm on this screen right here, what's my first step? The dashboard, yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. And then... Products. I want to add a new item to the menu. Appearance, and then we go to menus. Okay, so if I go to appearance, then menus, I see here that I don't have a category of cupcakes, so I have to go to the product category and add cupcakes. Now when I add it, of course it doesn't know where I want it, so it just adds it to the end. Obviously I have to drag it where I need it to be. Cakes, sugar-free cupcakes. Now it's a sub-menu item of that shop. It doesn't add it automatically. There is a button down here, automatically add new top-level pages to this menu, which I don't recommend. Uh, if I create a brand new screen, a brand new page, it'll add itself automatically to the menu. Sounds great. Not really, because it doesn't know where you want it. It'll just put it at the end. You're going to come back to the screen anyway to put it where you need it to go. So there's not much value to have that turned on. Auto add pages, it won't really know where I want it. And anytime you make any changes to your menus, remember to save. And now when I visit site under shop, I have the cupcakes category.
Now, when um, when you're on the front end here and you visit your various pages and you think about going home, you don't see too much here. Just this hello message. I wanted to show something more meaningful. Well, the default in WordPress is that it's um, on the home page, it's showing your latest article, your latest blog post. Um, <clears throat> I might want to change that so it so that it shows a, a more proper home page. So if we go back to the dashboard, and you click on posts, all posts, or not posts, pages. Go to all pages. These are the current pages that I have, a cart, checkout, etc., a sample page. But I don't have a, a home page. I don't have like a like the welcome screen, the home page, and such. So we're going to create one and then set it as the home page. So we will add a new page. Call it welcome. And just write a little bit, whatever you'd like here. Uh, welcome to our big our online bakery. We sell the best whatever. And then publish it. Okay, the thing here is that we've created a welcome screen, but it doesn't know that we want to use it as the welcome screen. It's just any other page on, on our site, not necessarily the home page. If I were to look at the at my site and if I you know if I browse the site and, and go to home, it doesn't know to put the welcome screen as this home screen. To do that we have appearance customize. Yes. Did you do publish or update? So we'll go to appearance customize. We never set any customization here, so it just chooses some defaults such as that um, sort of like intro post we wanted instead to have this welcome so appearance customize home page settings there's a lot of these that you can explore like the colors and all of that um, but right now we care about home page settings You can choose what's displayed on the home page. It can be posts, universe chronological order, which is the classic blog, or a fixed static page. To set a static home page, you first need to create two pages. One will be your home page, and the other will be where your posts are. This is a post, this is a blog post. It's the latest article. You look at the time right there. Well, this should be in its own blog category if you want a blog. This should say here, to set static, you first need two pages. You don't really need them both. I don't want my site to have a blog, so I don't really need a blog screen. But this is saying that if you want a blog, you will have you will need to create a page for your blog. Well, we did the we did the other one at least the home page screen. So instead of it having this latest article, latest post, we're going to set it to a static page. That welcome screen we just created, we wanted to display first instead of these articles. So we will say, my home page will display 
a static page and that static page will be the welcome screen I just created. It sort of optionally asks where would you like to put your posts. If I created a page called blog or articles or news or whatever, then I can put all those articles into that news screen. But at the very least, I want welcome to be the, the static page. So then now when people visit my site, it'll have that welcome message. Question. Yeah, there's no difference. I'm just using the. I'm just making it say the words "welcome" instead of you know "hello" or whatever. So they're both the same thing. Welcome and homepage, the same thing. It's the first screen that you see. So from this particular screen, you also have the ability to kind of edit. From here, I can also edit the menu. I can edit these other um, sidebar elements. If there's a little editing icon and then when I make changes I want to publish I'll put this into the notes default home screen is your latest blog post you probably want a static home page so create a home or welcome or intro whatever you want to call it page then go to dashboard appearance customize and home page settings yes They, they only care about the content also. So if your home page is constantly changing because you have new articles and such, that's fine. You have content. If your home page is only static and it never changes, that's fine. That's content. However, the, the, home, the search engines do care that your website gets updated on some amount of time. If it's the same web page for the last you know, two years, you might not get ranked as well as one that does once in a while, once a month or something, adds a new blog post, which is new content. And that new content doesn't have to be on your first screen. It can be anywhere in your site as long as it's new content. Oh, so, to that, so whatever, to change the content, the give you more attention. Yes. Yes. And it's changing it in terms of new content, not just simply changing it from, from it to saying welcome to hello or adding a new picture, not that kind of change. That, that's not a meaningful change. It's a change more like you've added something new, like new, new articles, new blog posts, new news items, new products, that those sort of changes are much more meaningful to the search engines. Set home page displays to the page you created. Optional, create a page for your blog and add posts there. Remember to click the, the button up at the top to publish, and then you can close this editor. And when you visit your site, now it's got the, the proper home screen.
So we've uh, we've looked at adding a couple of different types of products. Obviously, your store has two big concepts that need to be set up. One is your products and prices, and the other is collecting payment. Let's talk a little bit about collecting payment. If you go uh, back to the dashboard, if we go, if we hover over WooCommerce and then go to settings, there's a whole screen full of many settings here that we won't have time to get into, but the big ones are payments. So WooCommerce settings, payments. I have set up that I want PayPal to be the way that people pay. Now, PayPal does not require that um, they, they have an account before making a payment. They can still purchase. Uh, they can have their own credit card or debit card, or they don't have to have a balance in a PayPal account. They can use a credit or debit card. Uh, it's um, it's a very popular way to make to accept payments. It's been around since the 90s, and um, you uh, you can set it up pretty easily. All of these other ones, you probably don't really need them. Cash on delivery, no one does that anymore, and checks and such. So when you when you manage any payment method, there'll be options. And all of these over here, well, as you as you go through it, you see, do I want this on or off? What's the title for it? There's going to be a description. It'll tell people, pay via PayPal. You can pay with your credit card if you don't have a PayPal account. So a lot of times people think that you, um, if you've got a PayPal method on your website, a person has to have a PayPal account. Uh, they don't they've changed that so that it uh, doesn't have to have that. We won't go into too much detail but here it says set up or link an existing PayPal account. Well PayPal is the middleman that is going to take the person's credit card number and check do they have the money then transfer it sort of like an escrow for a little while and then transfer it to your bank and you have the money. It all happens pretty fast behind the scenes. But PayPal is the one that's going to sort of jump in at the moment that a person is actually buying. Uh, I mentioned on the first day that you should have security and SSL certificate on your site. However, the good news is that once you've got PayPal set up, it will sort of jump in at the right time and activate security for the person typing in their credit card number and all of that private stuff. So you should still think about getting an SSL certificate for your site because as, as a person is browsing my site over here they never see that little lock and then it's going to say something if they're curious your connection is not secure. Well they're not actually going to put the relevant information until they check out at the, at the shopping cart and that's when PayPal is going to jump in. So again, I'm not going to go too far into it. There's going to be a process here that I'll ask you. If you've got an existing account, please sign in with it. We'll make the connection. And then when people try to pay, you'll get the money. If you don't have a PayPal account, it's going to walk you through several steps to set that up. For payments, PayPal is one of many ways to set this up. A popular and secure way to do so. Tip, create a PayPal account at paypal.com 
first before setting up your WooCommerce connection to it. There's a lot of setup, there's a lot of um, things to agree to and credit card uh, bank accounts to link to and everything so even though it looks like yeah I can click here and start the setup I think it might be better for you to to first go over to paypal.com and separately out of your website here do a sign up procedure and um, then when you are in your site then you just type in your email address for your PayPal account and it'll set it up a lot faster also look at this literally 20 years ago and PayPal was founded and in internet time that's a long long time <clears throat> Yes, there is going to be some sort of fee, transaction fee. All uh, credit card processors have some fee. Now, like some of the newer ones, like Venmo, um, they 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 might not have a transaction fee. Someone's buying the product, but they might have a transfer fee in terms of. Uh, Venmo took the money for the product and they're holding it in your Venmo account. Well, then when you actually want to use it and you transfer it to your bank account, that's when there might be a fee. So there's almost always a fee for all of these. That's just the fact of it all. And usually they range 2% and up. Very common that I see is 2.9%, which is basically 3%, but uh, per transaction. So if you've got you know if you're buying if you're selling a hundred dollar item two percent well PayPal is or most of these pro processors will take two dollars and those things yeah they, they do add up but there's always someone in the middle when it comes to to money these other items are more cosmetic um, upload a logo so that it shows up on the invoice etc um, when someone tries to buy take them to the PayPal login screen etc they have to have a billing address they have to have a phone number and there's already all of these defaults here I think with the with the um, amount of time that we have and we've looked at the important things about products, payments, a little bit of pages and so forth, uh, we're getting to the part where I would usually um, end the lecture to do a little bit of lab time in case people want to work a little bit one-on-one -on -one and ask questions and such. But let me ask uh, general questions on anything that we've talked about so far that we might have a little bit more time to talk about and then we'll have some open lab time. Any general questions? Yes. You mean PayPal? Uh, no, I mean, uh, um, WordPress. no, your your WordPress site will stay as is unless you manually go into the updates screen and allow the updates so it, it should not be that your site is suddenly changing you know like my you know like Windows or the Mac or my phone constantly is doing these updates automatically without me even knowing it and then you know I, I wake up one morning and suddenly my icons are different um, your website is in WordPress uh, will not do these updates you have to manually when you want to do them We can what? WordPress? Uh, no, it would be more that your it's your service provider, which is GoDaddy, Bluehost, etc. The 
There is, and and I said previously that over at uh, WordPress.org, this is where we've got support. So there's the documentation, there's the forums where you can ask for direct help. Um, let me write it down over here because the that's a good question about where to get help. You have these these big ideas. You have uh, service provider, which is GoDaddy, Bluehost, etc. You also have WordPress.org. This is for the main WordPress and WooCommerce software. Usually it's email, and there's the various tiers depending what, what tier of service you have. If you have like the completely free WordPress and the completely free WooCommerce, the email responses and such might take you know three to five business days or whatever but if you p pay for like the premium services usually they respond in one day or phone calls and such yes it just it's gonna depend on the on the level of service that you buy and that's how a lot of these make their money nowadays not the actual product but the service to manage the product the theme or plugin developers that's another place uh, who made your design or features? WooCommerce is part of uh, WordPress, so you get tech support from that. But if I install a plugin that will help me uh, manage an email subscription list, that might be a different plugin, a different company. Somewhere in the settings of that plugin, there will be some sort of uh, help button to go initiate some sort of help and depending on that plugin and developer and such it'll say if it's via email or phone or free or premium etc so it really does vary any other general questions yeah exactly they all interact with your site, but not necessarily with each other. And what I mean by that is, I have um, I have a plugin that does one thing versus another thing. It doesn't matter. Like right now, I have this, the Facebook. Um, this one is designed that this Facebook is going to work with WooCommerce. But this one right here doesn't say that it's designed to work with something else, so it may or may not work with something else. But you are able to put. Um, as many plugins as you want and test them out and see how they behave all together because they come from different companies off, oftentimes. Because when you go into this web page, you show the menu for WooCommerce. Mm -hmm. But if you want to get, someone wants to get in touch with you or email you or mm -hmm. something, how does that plugin work with, you know, just with your With your site, yes. Um, but you could add a new, um, you know, contact form plugin. If you don't have the feature already, that's where the plugins come in. You would go to add new, and then search for contact form. So that would be added to the uh, WooCommerce. It would be added to it would be added to your whole site, your WordPress site. WooCommerce is in charge only of the e-commerce stuff, but your whole site is still a WordPress site the other capabilities of your site are still WordPress. It's just that WooCommerce is in charge of the e-commerce aspect of it. And this other one over here, maybe, Contact Form 7, that's in charge of the um, Contact Form aspect. So when they log into your website, they to bakery, they're going to see, they're going to have a, a choice of going to WooCommerce to make a purchase? Not really a choice, but it's on the menus over here there's a choice in that I can click on shop and there'll be a menu item contact so it's all all of this is WordPress I'm not looking at WooCommerce at the moment this is the main WordPress then when I click on here then it goes into sort of like the WooCommerce section of it but it's still WordPress and then if I have the button for contact it'll go into the screen on your website about that contact plugin question here um, uh, I was playing with the themes mm -hmm. you started out with yeah. Um, how come the others don't have any um, 
You have to go over to customize. See at the top here, every every design. It's sort of like when you see a preview. Like, oftentimes, like at a restaurant, mm -hmm. uh, at McDonald's, you see like an amazing hamburger on the menu. And when you buy it, it doesn't look the same, right? right? So when you activate these plugin, uh, when you activate these themes before you activate it, the preview looks amazing, mm -hmm. but often it depends on the photo and such. Well, you usually when you activate a new theme, you then have to go over to customize and see what options you might have to set on the left side here to make it look the most like the original, or your own style, your own design. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Question. So, um, since I'm so new at this, and I would like to make my website, uh, Yeah, there's a lot of great books um, that I would recommend about WordPress. Looking at this one over here, it's called uh, WordPress Quick Start. Um, there's this. There, there are these various um, WordPress books out there. One of the ones that I like is this one from the, from the Quick Start series. They have this little rabbit, and there's a lot of other ones like I haven't, I haven't used. I don't have any opinion on this one or, or this one. But throughout the years in various classes, this is one of the ones that I've recommended. So I would look at the, the latest. See, these are the older versions. But I would um, look up WordPress books. And the Visual Quick Start Guide is one of the ones that I, that I recommend. I, I like it because it's there's a chapter kind of like focused on one topic. So it really goes detail into detail on one topic. Like here's what all the details on posts. Here's all the details on themes, etc. So um, I would recommend that definitely. Besides classes, reading the official uh, WordPress manual, and, and that sort of thing, and just keep learning and practicing. Yeah, I would recommend it here too. Support documentation. This is where also the official WordPress manual is at, which is more more current and up-to-date than a book, right? Because that has to be edited and published and released, and the software changes all the time. Um, so reading the documentation from WordPress.org is the way to keep most up-to-date. Mm -hmm. That WordPress is starting to be out? Mm -hmm. Not really. I still see that it has a very large market share. I thought I saw somewhere over here that it said it had like 30% market share. Um, there are many ways to, to make a website in an e-commerce site, and they're all right, and they're all wrong. It just depends on what you particularly need. There are m more solutions coming out that are very focused on e-commerce, like Shopify and such. That one is... Uh, software that is not WordPress but it's a way to make a website and it's a way to make an e-commerce website WordPress has been around 10 years or more and it was it's been added to throughout the years so its first goal was not e-commerce it was blogging then it got expanded and upgraded to also include other kinds of sites and then it got expanded in, to include also e-commerce so it's something that's been built upon year after year after year but yes, there are newer things, Wix, Squarespace, Shopify, etc., that are newer, therefore more modern, not necessarily better, but they might focus more directly on something. Maybe I really need an e-commerce solution that is only about selling digital products. So maybe there's a software out there that's better than WordPress because WordPress tries to do a little bit of everything, but that other solution only focuses on t-shirts, so therefore it's the perfect one for me. But WordPress is the most popular way to make a website at the moment. And as I've taught these classes for several years, I remember saying, WordPress has 20% market share. WordPress has 24% market share. And today, if we look it up, I, I thought I saw somewhere here that it said like 31% market share. So it's still going up. And maybe something else will come and usurp it. But still, 30% of all the websites of the world is a big, is a big thing.
I haven't dealt with a lot of clients that only focus on service, so I can't give you the full answer. I've dealt mostly with clients that deal with products, uh, physical goods and such, so I have the best answer for that. But from what I understand, it looks like WordPress and WooCommerce and such still are also good solutions for services, not just physical products. Okay, so at this point, um, I'm going to end the lecture. I'm going to put the notes that I've been writing into the network folder. And I'll remind you where that folder is. And then again, all of this, I've been recording it. If you'd like to, um, to, to replay all of the videos, you can send me an email. If you've done so already, then I, I think I replied. If I didn't, I will reply. But remember, you can email me, vcampos at sdccd.edu. Ask for the WordPress lectures. So you can go back and, repl and replay what we did on Tuesday and replay what we did today and pause it and rewind it and all of that. And um, keep learning.